From Hollywood, it's Out of My Mind. I'm Jay Douglas, and in episode 14, we're going from minutes in Mother Nature to the dark side of medicines to looking for that big score. It's 17 minutes of bringing the essential, non-essential, and curiously essential information to baby boomers like you who haven't lost their curiosity. If you're not a baby boomer, you can still listen to the program. All you have to do is trade those blue jeans with the mass-produced holes in them for jeans with hand-sewn patches, some of which look like American flags. We're standing up and saluting as episode 14 of Out of My Mind begins in a matter of seconds. Here's a problem. Let's suppose you have an incredibly accurate clock. There is such a thing. It's called an atomic clock, and there are thousands of them in existence. But how can you tell which one of those is the most accurate? I mean, what can you compare it to? If it sounds as if this is a question for a college physics exam, you might want to pull up a chair and listen to this story of what happens when humans and nature get in each other's way. We start at the National Institute for Standards and Technology, or NIST. Andrew Novick is an electrical engineer with NIST, and to begin, I asked him for an example of why we need such accurate clocks. GPS, that's that's the number one way GPS works. So for positioning, each satellite has multiple atomic clocks on board. And every one second, they send packets of data And so when you, as an observer, like with your GPS receiver, like in your phone or handheld or on top of your building, uh, you receive these packets of data from all the GPS satellites in view every second. So if a a GPS satellite is closer to you, say more like overhead versus on the horizon, you'll get that one sooner than the one on the horizon. And part of the packet of data talks about where the satellite is. So the first one you get say the first packet you get, you know that you're closest to that satellite because they all sent it at the same time and they're all synchronized to the less than billions of seconds. And so the more, the more satellites you can see, the more you can kind of triangulate, quiet, quadrangulate, you know, et cetera, um, to get a really good position. And so it's, it's 100% based on time. A bit about these atomic clocks. They aren't clocks in the way we're familiar with them. They're a combination of what Andrew describes as an oscillator and a counter. Okay, if that's, if that's too far on the geek side, let's look at it this way. An oscillator is nothing more than something that repeats a particular action over and over. The counter is just a mechanism that can count the number of times an oscillator completes that one action. Here's an example. So if you have, say, uh, you know, a pendulum clock, the oscillator is the pendulum swinging back and forth, and the counter is the gears that are moving the hands. In the case of the pendulum, we're measuring each swing from left to right and back to the left. You can think of the oscillator in an atomic clock as a radio signal. When this signal causes cesium atoms to behave in a certain way, we start counting. It turns out that signal will swing back and forth 9,192,631,770 times a second. By comparison, the highest sound wave most humans can hear goes back and forth about 20,000 times a second. Oh, yes, this may be part of the quiz. So, let's say we have two counters. One counts the back and forth motion of the radio wave hitting the cesium atoms. Whenever that counter gets to 9 billion and some change, it resets itself to zero. And that's when the other counter ticks off another second. Now you have like a ticking clock. That's one, you know, that's, that's the definition of one second. Not just any second, but an internationally recognized second. That's right. There's no such thing in nature as a second. It's not something you can point at, photograph, or touch. It's an agreement among scientists, and it gets better. Since we can't measure which atomic clock is right, we have to guess at what the time is. This guess is called Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. It's a mathematical computation based on the time from hundreds of atomic clocks in laboratories all over the world. In other words, what we call time... It's an agreement within the world scientific community. And where does that leave the foundation of our sense of time, the second? It would be completely arbitrary if it weren't historically tied to something that each of us can observe. And that's the pattern of day and night. Seconds used to be defined as one eighty-six thousand four hundredth of a day. 
It was just some kind of convenient way to break up the day into these hours and 24 hours. When atomic clocks came around in the 60s, um, you know, we found it was they were more stable than the rotation of the Earth. When we found out that the Earth is not quite as stable as the atomic clocks, then when we redefined the second based on atomic time instead of, um, you know, the Earth's rotation. And here's where humans and nature clash. That instability Andrew mentioned, when the one in the Earth's rotation, it means that atomic clocks and our old definition of time don't always agree. And that left us with a choice. Change the Earth's rotation or change the behavior of atoms. Neither solution satisfied everybody. So scientists fudged it. When, when we defined um, time based on atomic seconds, we didn't want to totally get rid of the Earth because really the time of day is linked with the Earth. The Earth is getting off from um, this you know, more stable definition of time by about one second every year and a half or two. And so whenever the Earth gets about 0.5 seconds away from the defined uh, time in its rotation, we have a leap second. So it's an extra second put in at the end of the day, the very last second in either June or December. And it's an extra second. It kind of lets the Earth catch up. We might have, you know, two, in a, two, two like 12 months apart. We might not have one for three years. You know, it's just based on the the um, irregularity of the rotation of the Earth. Now, the Earth and the definition of the second appear to be in agreement. Only we've created a programming nightmare for any electronic device with a clock in it, which is just about all of them. When you have this extra second in there, and it's like, you know, it's, it's second number 60. So it's like goes 50, instead of going like 58, 59, zero to the next minute, it goes 58, 59, 60, and then that next minute. So you can see where it could cause people problems, and it's just based on software. They, you know, you have to be able to handle it, but because it's not a, a normal occurring thing, it only happens when the Earth gets out far enough, and it's announced, you know, several months in advance. But it's not a, it's not a normally occurring thing, so you can't really plan for it. You have to be able to program it in. Remember that chiffon margarine television commercial, the one that ended with "It's not nice to fool Mother Nature." It wasn't then. It isn't now. And apparently it won't be 500 years from now either. There's a lot of countries and meetings and things about getting rid of the leap seconds. Um, and, you know, there's proposals for like going to like a leap minute or a leap hour, you know, because, you know, we're all used to changing up to an hour during daylight saving time. So if one time, like 500 years from now, we had a leap hour, then they would just have to deal with it and they'd just take that hour out or whatever. But that would basically kick the can down the road to, like, beyond all of our lifetimes. Andrew Novick is an electrical engineer in the Time and Frequency Division of NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. If all of this leaves you wondering what time it is, Andrew says NIST can help. There's a telephone number you can call and a website you can visit to get the agreed-upon international time whenever you need it. I'll put that information in the show notes. I'll also put in links to the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, where you can read more about time on a galactic scale, to NIST's brief history of the atomic clock, and to a story on how the United States built the most accurate clock ever. And if you'd like to know how the international community measures and agrees upon time, Andrew tells that story in an episode extra. You'll find it on YouTube. Go to outofmymindpodcastonyoutube.com. That's out of my mind podcast on youtube.com. Click on playlists and then on extras. It's time for a 60s prediction that's come true. Remember when our parents, teachers, and the television set warned us about the evils of drugs? You start small and soon it's on to who knows what. It might be a little too late to admit it, but it seems they were right. Only we have to make a few changes to the story. Instead of marijuana, we begin with mouthwash. It makes you feel good. Uh, it may have some alcohol in it, which has some uh, germ-killing, bacteriocidal uh, effects. Um, but mouthwash really has no clinical value. That's prosthodontist Alan Zweig. He specializes in the restoration and replacement of teeth. He feels we're part of a 21st century drug culture. Rather than brushing well, we rely on mouthwash to keep our teeth and gums healthy. Got a cavity? The drugstore has a little something for that. Got a toothache? The drugstore has something for that, too. 
cold sore, canker sore, drugstore, and drugstore. I think any over-the-counter medication that they sell to put on canker sores or toothaches or anything, I think they're worse than the problem. Um, first of all, people think they're getting a therapeutic effect from them, and they're really not. And that delays them coming in to get a diagnosis or getting it treated or whatever. They do more harm than good. Yes, my tongue is in my cheek here. Dr. Zweig never brought up the 60s drug culture analogy. That's all me. But that's not to say we should take our drug fetish lightly. As Dr. Zweig cautions, turning to self-medication can delay our getting the help we need. And it's often a poor substitute for the real cure. See, we are in a, we're, we're, we are in a society, we are in a medical um, frame of mind where there's a solution to every problem, where there's got to be a solution to every problem. So if I have a canker sore and it hurts me, I got to take, I got to go to the drugstore and find something that's going to heal it. Unfortunately, um, there's nothing that heals it. There, I, there have been products that have come out um, uh, o over the years to try to accelerate the healing, but the only thing that heals it is your own natural immune system. And you, you want to find something to put something on it, and it just makes it worse. And actually what it does is it may make it worse and take the pain away, but it would st instead of a week, it would take two or three weeks for it to heal. Sometimes you need... Uh, what they used to say, tincture of time and supervised neglect. Dr. Alan Zweig is a prosthodontist and has been practicing in Beverly Hills for the last 34 years. He believes that less is more when it comes to treating many of our illnesses. His website has information on how you can maintain your health, starting at the top with your teeth and gums. I've put links in the show notes. If you're listening on YouTube, you can get to the show notes by clicking on the Read Show Notes banner that will appear toward the end of the show. In episode 12, composer and educator Charles Bernstein, who has written over 100 film and television scores, talked about the reason scores are necessary. We're not always sure in the movie medium what it is that we're supposed to be feeling while we're experiencing the story. The score solves this storytelling problem through music's ability to evoke and even manipulate our emotions. In this episode, Charles takes a look at the other side of his job, the business side. The role of the score in making a film marketable and memorable. That starts with a score that talks the musical language of the audience. You know, the demographic of the audience and what the movie's aimed at is a big factor. You get a movie like the Lego movie, and any attempts at esoteric uh, are totally beside the point. Whereas a movie in the same year, um, the Grand Budapest Hotel, You've got a kind of uh, hybrid gypsy uh, ersatz kind of music that uh, the wonderful Alexandre Desplat wrote. It's making references to music that young people have no real interest in. Having a score that speaks to the audience is what we might call a must-have quality. But the score and the film it's in is only experienced for a couple of hours at best. Studios want mileage out of that music. Executives want audiences connecting with it when they're not watching the film. In other words, they want more than a great score. They want great music. There are two requirements for great film music. Uh, and the, the same requirements we apply for Academy Award for song, for instance, I'll, just in terms of the song. To be Oscar worthy, a song has to fulfill two very broad requirements. One is it has to really be important in the storytelling, and it has to do that really well, uh, integrated and integral to the plot, to the story, and to how it's told. At the same time, the song has to be really terrific. You know, it has to be singable and rememberable, you know, memorable, and it has to just be a great song, and it has to be the kind of song, in my estimation anyway, that if you take it away from the film, it still has legs. It can still survive on its own. But if the music and the storytelling are interrelated, should a score be able to stand alone? Should we be able to listen to it in a live performance or as part of an album without the pictures, the dialogue, or the plot? When you take a score away from a movie, uh, if you took it really took it away from a movie, the movie would fall down <laughs> because it usually is holding the movie up. So I don't mean take it away from the movie, but take it apart from the movie and, and play it by, on its own. 
it can do and should do two things. It should evoke in the audience the memory, the feeling, the feeling sense of that movie and the, to, to re-experience the, the joys of the movie. And it should be great music. If it fulfills both of those, it's very good indeed, because sometimes you take the music out of a movie, it's duller than dishwater, it has no, there's no there there, you know, but it really works in the movie, it really supports the movie. I can think of a number of movies that have these kind of opaque, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's transparent, you know, scores that are very insubstantial, and, and they do what they need to do, but you take it away from the movie and it doesn't quite work as music. You know, it doesn't have enough interest to it. Ask Charles the composer where a score belongs. My personal philosophy is keep it in the movie. But ask Charles the educator the same question. I would encourage a general awareness of music and film. And if it means going to the concert hall, if it means buying records, uh, all the better, you know, just expands. But to, but to have an appreciation and an awareness of what the music's doing uh, on repeated viewings of a film to start to maybe tune in a little bit to how the music is doing what it does and to develop a appreciation for and uh, a interest in what the composer does. And uh, if we've done a little bit of that by discussing this now, I, I think we will have done something useful. Charles Bernstein is a composer, writer, educator, creator of over 100 film scores, and author of at least as many books and essays on the subject of film and film music. I've put links to his website, his books, and some of his other writings in the show notes. Just go to outofmymindpodcast.com. That's outofmymindpodcast.com. Click on episode 14 and follow the link to show notes. And that's the final note on which we'll end episode 14 of Out of My Mind. I'll be back with a new show next Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern. I've been lax in mentioning this, but our little show here has its own monthly newsletter. If you'd like to read a few interesting articles and stories that didn't make it into the program, you can subscribe to the newsletter by going to outofmymindpodcast.com. That's outofmymindpodcast.com. On a computer, you'll see the subscription form in the right-hand margin. If you're using a mobile phone, you probably will have to scroll down a bit until the form pops into view. Thanks for being a part of the program today. And we'll talk next week. I'm Jay Douglas. Out of My Mind is produced by Penny Summers and is a production of the Theater of Your Mind Incorporated, Hollywood, California.